Hey everyone, welcome to History Today. It's a podcast style discussion of the way history makes its way into our daily lives. Today we'll be discussing God of War 4 and in particular the Norse enemies that you fight. Uh, So I do want to have the caveat that we're going to be focusing more so on the creatures than the gods and goddesses themselves. This video is going to be hopefully spoiler free in that respect. We'll be going over some of the lower tier enemies and trying to give you a brief background on where they're coming from uh, in Norse mythology. Uh, And to enlighten us once again, we have James McMullen. He's been in previous episodes before where we talk about the Vikings and these uh, medieval Scandinavians. Uh, so we talked about, you know, how to survive a Viking winter, why the Vikings went west, etc. Lots of cool stuff. Uh, so he's joining us once more. If you haven't been introduced to him just yet, I'll let him do his intro uh, here and say hello. Thanks very much for having me back, Julian. Um, just for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a museologist from Canada. Uh, I've also got a uh, some background in medieval Icelandic. I did a master's uh, up in Iceland. Uh, and I'm currently waging an eternal war against Viking misinformation online. Uh, you can find me on Twitter screaming about Vikings and museums and politics. If you want to give me a follow, it's uh, at the Viking Gym. I'll be more than happy to take a look at what you got and uh, follow you on back. Sweet. So yeah, we'll be diving right into the creatures, the Norse enemies from God of War 4. Uh, one of the things I did want to touch on is you're seeing a lot of focus on the Vikings and the medieval Scandinavians as of late. Uh, it's in TV shows, it's in movies, it's in uh, games now. It's spreading all over the place. So it's pretty awesome and it makes for a lot of uh, content for us to discuss. It's cool to see it's uh, a revival. And maybe we'll do a separate video on maybe the history of the history of the Vikings, when it became popular. Uh, that could be a cool future episode. Uh, and why it's yeah, that maybe... would be that'd be something really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> why it's maybe coming back, uh, but anyways, we'll dive into the creatures themselves. Uh, and as you'll note, uh, their mythology is just freaking fantastic. Uh, so the first three <laughs> creatures we're going to be focusing on are going to be the Draugr, the Revenants, and then the Valkyries. So these are pulled straight out of the game, and they do have pretty strong similarities to their uh, mythological counterparts. Uh, but the reason we've kind of started with these three and grouped them together is because they all kind of revolve around. Um, human spirits who have kind of stayed in the world either um, you know staying on in corporeal form or in spirit form so these three are going to be very much tied to you know human fallen uh, people and uh, so to start this discussion we're going to be really briefly just touching on you know what were the Norse views of the afterlife and then how did this then bleed into the these various forms of creatures or enemies so maybe Mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah, the, the, the afterlife in Norse mythology, like the, the concept of it, is weird. <laughs> um, there's there's a few different types of interpretations of it. We have um, the sort of interpretations that are coming from Snorri Sturluson and the Edda, where uh, when you die, if you are a, a valiant warrior, you get chosen by... Uh, by the Valkyries and and the Valkyrie or other excuse me and you know you take you're taken to Valhalla and that's the the sort of popular conception of it. Uh, it's not entirely the case uh, in reality or in in the 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 texts. Um, the dead are in in the, the Edda. The dead are either going to hell, uh, which is not hell like we consider it in a sort of um, western christian sort of concept of it uh a, a place of punishment but rather the the hall of the goddess hell uh which is a cold dark damp place uh generally unpleasant um unless you died a heroic death uh, a, a great death um and if you did you were taken either to valhalla by the valkyrie um or you were sent to Folkvanger, which is the field of the people is what it literally means. Uh, it's where the goddess uh, Freya kind of did her thing. And since she was the goddess of war, amongst other things, it makes sense that she would get half of the, the noble dead, is how they're referred to. Um, the ones who died in gloriously in battle, the first half go to Freya, uh, and Woden has picked the other half with his, his Valkyries to, to go to Valhalla. Um, where they they live on as uh, what are called uh, the the lone fighters who, you know, they they feast and fight all day and they they do everything your sort of typical warrior elite nobility would think is awesome, um, which is mostly just feasting and drinking and fighting, uh, which if that's your thing, that ain't bad. Um, But then we get into the sagas and concepts of the afterlife get a little bit weirder, um, they're, they're a little bit less settled. Uh, 
because the sagas are all, for the most part, written in a Christian context, we've got some ideas of, uh, you know, a very peaceful afterlife, a, a sort of very pleasant afterlife uh, for some people who, who uh, are called uh, hoikbui, uh, which is basically like the, the dwellers in the mound is basically what it translates to. And these are people whose spirits, they stay in, in this mound and they feast and they drink and they, they basically live a very good life, a good afterlife related to their burial mound. Um, and then we run into uh, the the idea of Droiger and, and Aptergonger, the, the aftercomers or afterwalkers, rather, excuse me, um, the, the ones who are dead and who are, for lack of a better term, kind of restless. Um, so yeah, I mean, that kind of, the, the, the enemies in this game, uh, the, the Droiger, uh, you know, that are undead warriors who died in battle but are blinded with rage not too far off from the the sort of depictions of Troiger in the sagas they tend to be um, physical manifestations of the dead whether they're uh, some sort of monstrous dead creature like you would see in um, in in a, as a guardian of a tomb protecting uh, protecting treasures or a magic sword or something or an ancient sword or something like that uh, or they could just be general malicious spirits tied to a particular area um, so so that's not too far off from the sources uh, the 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 idea of these droger as uh, vicious fighting monsters who, who are out to cause unpleasantness for uh for our heroes uh that does that does tend to be the way they get uh, described in the sagas so they're um are they in a sense at all tied to like reanimated corpses or zombies or is it more the person has died and then their spirit comes back and kind of takes corporal form they well see that's the thing um <laughs> with, with the sagas we don't get a whole lot of detail uh right. in uh, in in descriptions and things like that, um, they from the the sort of impressions that we get from the texts, they are corporeal, physical, reanimated beings for the most part, skeletons uh, or or you know decomposing bodies, things like that, just sort of like your your stock image of like a zombie or a ghoul, but much more powerful like they're these are supernaturally strong creatures um you know and they they tend to have supernatural powers as well in Gretis saga you know the he he gets into a a, a duel for lack of a better term with a droiger and you know it's it's this Gretir is one of the strongest men to ever live and this creature is super powerful and and supernaturally powerful and gives him a pretty good run for his money um so but again is a physical sort of being that has come back as as a basically like a reanimated corpse okay so these guys i, I know we can't dive too deep because there's not too much information but my impression i guess or at least looking up the wiki on god of war what they say is these guys basically did not go to the afterlife because they're seeking revenge is there any way you can kind of appease them or you know put them at rest and then eventually they'll go back to heaven or are they just stuck here in this world well see that's the thing um when we encounter them in in the sagas when we encounter them in the literature they're usually either destroyed uh or they're they're given you know they're they're paid off they're they're bribed to to let our heroes go do what they want to do um some sort of appeasement is given to them if they're destroyed that's that's you know that's it the the corporeal form is gone and uh we don't hear from them again uh if they're paid off generally speaking we don't hear from them again either but that's just because the narrative moves on what happens to them afterwards we don't really know um but again it tends to be a sort of uh once they're dealt with they're dealt with there, there's no real uh, no real concept of them kind of moving on or going to another afterlife it's just from what we what you can kind of gather is that once they're destroyed that's all she wrote for them. got it cool we're learning a lot all right moving on to the next one is going to be the the revenants uh so these guys are pretty interesting um if the drogers or 
how, how did you say it again? The dra- Draeger? Uh, Draeger. 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 There yeah. you go. Uh, so the rev- <laughs> whereas the Draeger are more, I guess, uh, physical. I think the Revenants are going to be the ones that are a bit more uh, on the spirit end of that spectrum, but still mm. being tied to kind of reanimated humans or humans in the afterlife in a way. Uh, so can you tell us about Spirits, these guys? Spirits, yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there are accounts of... Um, Again, for lack of a better term, restless spirits of, of of the spirits of particularly vicious or evil um, figures and characters who, when they die, come back and they haunt, you know, the heroes of the saga. They, they tend to be associated to a place. Um, they tend to be just generally malicious sort of people, malicious sort of um, emanations. And, Again, they they are they're present. They're dealt with typically uh, by either a priest coming in and blessing the place and and you know chasing them off. Because once you get to to the sagas, once you get post conversion, you know these are are clearly emanations from the devil. And you know you you bring in a priest, he says his words, and there you go, uh, they are gone. Um, but uh, you know you also see spirits. Uh, appearing in earlier sources and sources that take place pre-conversion, uh, in stories that take place pre-conversion, and they are, again, kind of dealt with either as premonitions, as like sort of malicious apparitions in a dream, um, or they are dealt with as, you know, actual spirits, intangible spirits that that appear in a house, in in a forest, in a, near a burial mound, or something like that, and that will torment our heroes until they fulfill a you know a task, they 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 complete a quest, or they bring them something that they want, or they you know bring to justice somebody who had wronged the spirit while they were alive, or something like that. Got it. And I'm I'm taking a look here at the uh, the artwork uh, and the model that they put together for these guys. So. The, the artist definitely went ham on them. They have them <laughs> looking uh, crouched over with this long kind of wispy hair that almost looks like natural growth. And then their backs are open blood eagle style. So they went, they went all out on these guys, uh, kind of tacking every yeah. little trope from Norse mythology and stacking them on these guys. Um, so they look cool, but uh, they can yeah. take, I guess, any form and historically. You, or yeah, and, and well, that's the thing, right? Like they, they would, you know, if, if they're described, they'll be described as looking like a person. Uh, as being, you know, recognizable as the person who they're, whose spirit they are, um, or sometimes they will shift form. You know, they'll appear as a, as a, a malicious creature of some sort. Um, you know, they they can show up as as all sorts of different forms if they feel like, depending on how the narrative wants it to go. Um, you know, you can go from anything from a, uh, from you know, it looks like. A, a dead relative who you wronged to a malicious walrus, which is actually something that uh, Wait, that what? did show up in <laughs> a malicious walrus. Yeah, 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 <laughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's the, you got to remember, right? Like, there's there's all sorts of creatures that will show up um, in the world around you in in this time. You know, walruses are are not uncommon, or were not uncommon uh, in Scandinavia when you're just kind of out and about if you're sailing around especially and those things are terrifying if they're angry and if it's you know an evil spirit taking the form of one it's slightly more (laughs) horrifying than just usual seeing a walrus coming at you and uh it's 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 weird but a lot of these stories a lot of these supernatural stories they get real weird real quick yeah well, that's a shame that they didn't make that an enemy type in the game. <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> Maybe it's a hidden boss people haven't found yet. Uh, oh, there you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> so let's move on to kind of the last of the initial three, which is going to be moving on to the Valkyries here. Uh, so we've mentioned them kind of tangentially when we were uh, talking about the earlier um, uh, undead who didn't go to the realm of the afterlife to meet with Odin and Freya. So, so these guys are the ones who actually do make the journey forward, I guess. Or who come to carry people over? Yeah, Val- Valkyrie are, 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 you know, the stereotypical sort of depiction of them as you know, uh, beautiful warrior women 
is stereotypical for a reason. That's how they're described in the the all of the mythological sources. Um, these are the the choosers of the slain, the guides of the dead to Valhalla. Um, they are hosts and servants in Valhalla. They they're described as bringing wine, as serving wine to the the people in Valhalla. Um, they show up on memorial stones. At least we think they're they're Valkyrie on these memorial stones. Uh, women in long cloaks that are feathered, holding um, you know cups and chalices. Uh, they're depict or they're described as you know warriors, protective spirits, supernatural heroes in their own rights, um, and they're capable of changing shape. In theory, that's a suggestion. Uh, they're described as wearing um, is it uh, swan cloaks, and when you when you read or see a depiction of a swan cloak or a bird cloak, that tends to be something that is a magic item that will allow you to change form into that bird. Uh, Freya has a falcon feather cloak, and she can turn into a falcon. She gives it to Loki for in one of the stories, and he turns into a falcon when he puts it on. Um, you know, in, um, oh, where was it? Uh, I believe it's, Vol yes, uh, Volundar, Volundar Kavida. Uh, there are three Valkyrie who are found by uh, the brothers Slagfeder, Eil, and Volund. Um, and when they find them, they're, they're wearing their, or they're near their swan garments, and they're, they're bathing, so they're not, not wearing these swan cloaks, but they have them and so there's the suggestion that they change forms um but yeah valkyries are generally speaking not pleasant beings to be around if you are in a fight um you know they're, they're described as armed and armored blood covered uh warriors um in one of the poems in uh, Heldakvida Hundingspana, uh, the first poem from there. Um, they're described as uh, uh, what's the what's the word? Uh, you know, they're 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 described as Bernies drenched in blood. They're their armor drenched in blood and rays of light shining from their spears, uh, covered with you know wearing helmets when they they come to battle. Um, they're also, as I said, you know, the choosers of the slain. Uh, basically, in, in the mythology, is that Odin will choose, you know, certain warriors to die in a battle. You know, say, okay, I need you in Valhalla, and that means you have to die right now. And the Valkyries will go out and will, you know, either wait for them to die or potentially kill them or remove their protection from them. Um, there is in Sigurdrifamal, the Valkyrie Sigdrif Sigurdrifa is punished for either killing or allowing to be killed um, a particular king that Odin had promised victory to. Uh, so, you know, the, the implication there is that the Valkyries are just as capable of killing someone as protecting someone in a fight. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the sort of combination of Odin's choice and their own will to do so. Um, so it's, it's they're, they're very... What you think of as a Valkyrie is, unlike a lot of stuff in Norse mythology, uh, almost exactly what it's like in the source. So, that's uh, that's really that's a really good one. And the the Valkyries in this, uh, apart from the fact that they're enemies um, because they've been cursed, uh, you know, apart from that, that seems to be pretty much on par with the source material. Hmm. Sweet. All right, so with that, we've eaten up most of our time going over the first three, so let's keep plowing on into the next ones. The, the next one I'm actually very excited about, this one's uh, about the wolvers. So we're still sticking to kind of human form, uh, and then after that we'll get into stuff like trolls, ogres, dragons, uh, dwarves, etc. Uh, so let's get into the wolver one. So this one's pretty interesting. Basically, they're just ripping off the concept of a werewolf here. Um, so we were going back and forth discussing, you know, what back... Uh, what ties does this have to Norse mythology? And I think for the most part, it's kind of something that they had to borrow from a different culture to shoehorn into this game. Uh, but that being said, there are still some interesting parallels you can draw. And I think part of it, when we had discussed kind of prior to this, part of it was the idea that for a lot of human cultures, kind of early on in the development, 
there's you know they believe in the spirits uh of the animals or the trees or all that stuff kind of um i can't remember what the exact term is but anyways you see nature uh, melding with the afterlife and then in the spiritual and all that and then there are certain instances where you can cross over between the two you cross over in a spiritual you cross into the animal and that's kind of what this idea of man transforming into a wolf or a wolver in this case I guess may have its ancestral roots in um, but I think you had some more specific examples of maybe where they're tying it to in a more uh, recent sense as opposed to the far past yeah I mean wolvers are, are they're a Shetlandic thing um, so from the Shetland Islands, and there's a, there's a very big Celtic influence on them, uh, given that. Um, but in, in a purely Norse tradition, there's the idea of berserkers and Urfhednar and things like that. Um, Urfhednar uh, means literally wolf's head. Um, we kind of see that sort of atavistic you know, impression of, of, the, of the animal spirit onto the self or the self onto the animal. Um, in these guys, you'll see examples from uh, helmets and things like that of warriors, you know, either dancing or preparing for battle. You know, you can tell they're warriors because they've got their spears and their swords and they're wearing armor, but they're also wearing a wolf's head and skin as kind of like a cloak and mask. Um, you know, these are the this is the idea where you've got, you know, they're taking the, the spirit of the wolf. In theory, they're taking the spirit of the wolf to, to take its power and become, you know, more animalistic uh, in their combat or what have you. Right. So there's there's definitely that um, that idea of bringing the spirit of that sort of that that sort of naturalistic spirit into you to to become more powerful. But there's also kind of the reverse um, where you can, for lack of a better term, astrally project as a, a spirit creature. Um, there's actually a story uh, in Hrofsaga Kraka. Uh, there's a character named Bodvar Bjarki. He is kind of the analog of Beowulf, the, the Norse saga analog of Beowulf. Uh, and in the, the final battle of King Hrolfr, uh, you know, he decides to help the king out by going into a trance and projecting himself as his filgur, his protective spirit, which in this case is a giant spiritual bear. Uh, and it's incredibly effective, uh, you know, because it's a bear in a battle, um, and a spirit bear at that, a supernatural bear at that. So it's a lot more powerful, a lot more effective than just having another even skilled warrior like like Bodvar uh, in in the fight. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see that sort of idea of the, the, the transformation into something uh, other than yourself as a, you know, manifesting like an extra power and, and becoming more, um, well, just, just more animalistic or, or more in tune with the, the sort of natural old spiritual powers that way. Got it. But there was no real tradition of uh, full moon comes out and all of a sudden, you know, people are going to start transforming into wolves. That's separate tradition. No, not... That's that's a that's a separate that's a that's more of a continental sort of later into the medieval period uh, sort of thing uh, rather than a, a strictly Norse thing. There's no sort of oh it's the full moon and now I'm a I'm a monstrous wolf man. No, that, that that didn't happen. It's I got real upset in a fight and I have kind of changed my form a little bit because I've gone into a berserker rage or something like that. Um, but that's possibly because i'm descended from trolls on my mom's side <laughs> um and right and that that tends to be a thing that does happen in sagas with berserkers they tend to to go undergo what's called hamramr which is the transformation of form or change of form um into something human ish like monstrously humanoid Sweet. Well, speaking of, you mentioned real briefly the trolls and the ogres, so let's get into into those guys. Uh, so kind of the previous ones we've all covered are based in some sense at some point in time, kind of human. And now we're going to get into the creatures that are a bit more separate. Uh, so we're going to go over the trolls first, the ogres after this. Uh, so maybe you can give us a bit of a detail on the trolls. And actually, first, uh, before you get into it, I do want to give a little bit of a preamble as well. Uh, so when we first started the discussion about the trolls, my impression was that, or my guess was, hey, the trolls probably come from this similar idea that, as I was mentioning before, early humans tend to see, you know, uh, the spiritual and the 
um, the supernatural in nature. And so my guess was, hey, these trolls are probably, you know, the local spirit of the local mountain, or maybe there's a troll of the local river or whatever. Maybe that's, you know, it's the protector of that area or a spirit. Um, so I'm not sure how on or off point that is, but maybe you can tell us more about these trolls. Yeah, you're, you're not too far off the mark. Um, trolls tend to be associated with without or, uh, be associated with things outside of civilization um you tend to see them you know mountain trolls uh, you tend to see uh you know river trolls things like that they do get mentioned uh in the sources but not very frequently what you see a lot of in the sagas are people who are related to trolls uh, you know like i said you know i'm i'm half troll on my mom's side is not an uncommon thing to to find out in the genealogy of uh of saga characters um in Eil saga for example uh Eil Skala Grimson, his grandfather is the is the the nephew on his mom's side of a guy named Hopjorn Haftroll. Um, we never find out what uh, what Ail's grandfather's mother's name was, but you know it's kind of a safe assumption that she was also whoever Haftroll. Um, you know, there's this, and because of that descent as with the the Haftroll uh, on his great grandmother's side, uh, you know he has these these fits of rage. He's not a berserker. In the strictest sense, uh, so he doesn't go into to pure pure berserker rages, but he does have um, <clears throat> he he's described as monstrous and and ugly and you know dark haired and and big bushy eyebrows and heavy uh, bone structure and you know he gets angry really quickly and when he does get angry he's he's incredibly dangerous. Um, his father Skalagrim, you know, would fly into for lack of a better term, berserker rages, although, again, he wasn't strictly speaking a berserker. Um, but he would, you know, go hamramar. He would, you know, become monstrous in his in his visage and, you know, would smash people to death with his bare hands. Um, and uh, Eil's grandfather, Kveldulfur, uh, you know, he would do the same. You know, there, he dies uh, after going into a berserker rage, into, into a full-on berserker rage. Um... You know, and he's exhausted afterwards and then dies shortly after that. But he can do that because he has more trollish blood in him. So trolls are kind of these wild spirits that are outside of, you know, civilization, outside of society, but are not things that are, strictly speaking, you know, intangible or, or things that you can't interact with because some of these saga heroes are their, you know, their ancestors did interact with them in a lot of different ways. Okay, so they do seem a bit more grounded, kind of this race of large humanoid creatures, but are kind of out there over in the distance that you might encounter and interact with or have a grandfather yeah. <laughs> who was a troll or something. Exactly, exactly, okay. right? You know, if, if you're you're out in the wilderness and you're with, uh, you're with a bunch of trolls, eh, it gets cold in the winter. There's a lot of different ways to keep warm. <laughs> Okay, cool. So we covered the trolls, and then I guess similar to them are going to be the ogres, but these are a little bit different, I guess, because you were telling me they come from... Uh, they're introduced a little bit later in term, in, into the mythology. Yeah, the, these are... Ogres are like a late 12th century French um, creature, as far as we can tell. Um, the the earliest attestation is from Chrétien de Troyes... Uh, Romance Parzival le Comte de Kral, which is uh, like late twelfth century, so it's like I think eleven eighties is the uh, earliest reference we have to them. So bringing them into Norse mythology, I can kind of see why you'd want to do that because they are similar superficially to trolls in that they're monstrous and terrifying, um, and they exist outside of normal society. But as far as in the sources themselves go we never actually get explicit mention of ogres they're, they're just always just you know either either trolls or or giants or uh you know dwarves and elves and things like that but never uh, never anything that is explicitly mentioned or related to an ogre got it a bit more of a fantasy creature i guess uh that we know yeah a bit more of now uh okay so yeah and i mean oh go it, ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, yeah, it's not outside the realm of possibility that, you know, 
the the authors of you know old Norse or Scandinavian uh, romances and things like that would have known about ogres. I mean, it, the the literary tradition, the the exchange of of ideas is very rich in the medieval period, but for this sort of classical idea of old Norse mythology, they're yeah, not really something that would show off. Got it. Cool. Well, let's move on. we got a couple more to get through here. So the next one is going to be the big baddies. Uh, here we have dragons. Uh, so we can touch real briefly on these. Uh, they do appear in the game several times. Um, so I was curious, you know, how, there was the How to Train Your Dragon films that came out, the animated ones. Uh, but prior to that, I wasn't super familiar with kind of dragons coming out of North mythology. So that kind of uh, surprised me a little bit. Uh, so how kind of, yeah. how, how large is their presence? Not really large in a Scandinavian context. They tend to be more continental. So you see them in Germanic contexts. You see them in Anglo-Saxon contexts, things like that. Uh, you know, there's the famously the dragon at the end of Beowulf, right? You know, it's the big fire-breathing dragon that Beowulf cuts open with a, an iron dagger. Um, but in Norse mythology, there's only really three that stand out. Um, there's uh, Jormungandr, the, the world serpent, who is described as a dragon. Uh, there's Nidhogr, the uh, dragon that sleeps at the base of Yggdrasil, the world tree, uh, and you know he gnaws on all the dead, uh, the, the corpses of the dead. That's what his name uh, means, is the, the underhewer. It's the, the, the one who, who bites at the base of the tree. And then there's uh, Fafnir, who, who is a dwarf that goes out into the, into the wilderness and he finds a, a great huge... Uh, horde of gems and, and jewels and his greed transforms him into uh, a dragon uh, eventually and he guards this this horde of jewels and gems uh, from everybody who would come to take it and uh, eventually uh, you know he's killed by Sigurd the you know if, if you're familiar at all with uh, you know the ring cycle by Wagner uh, this is where that this is where this is coming from, um, you know. So Sigurd kills him and then takes the the gold and jewels. Uh, but again, he's he's this cunning, greedy, grasping creature that is there to defend these this horde of of precious objects. Um, but that's really for for dragons. That's really about it uh, in a purely Norse. Uh, concept of it i mean we have later on we have um obviously cultural exchange from continental sources where dragons are more in the um in the, the conscience and and or conscious rather excuse me and and um culture of scandinavians and that's why you'll find like ormurin langi the the long serpent um it's you know it's uh, one of the the long ships um and and you know the the idea there is that it's a you know it's the the big dragon right it's it's there to terrify people um but again in the oldest sources not so much okay well cool so these dragons that we've described there's not really enough of them to to be able to paint a broad theme they all seem to have kind of unique characteristics but in a certain sense, they still do check a couple of the, the main dragon check boxes. They can breathe fire. Some of them are associated with uh, hoarding of wealth and treasure. Uh, can these all fly as well? Like, what other dragon features do they have? They're never really mentioned explicitly as flying um, or, or really as winged uh, in Norse sources. Uh, I mean, there's the, the concept that, you know, now we've got this idea of dragons having wings, but... Uh, as far back as we can find uh, depictions of them, they are just very long, very toothy uh, serpents, right? They're, they're there to, they're long creatures who will circle around whatever they're protecting and will bite anybody who try, tries to come at them. So, um, so again, not so much the flight, but we do have in Beowulf, the fire breathing. In, uh, in uh, Volsunga Saga, we have the protecting the the horde of jewels and, and gold that also is in Beowulf. Um, in uh, in the Edda, we have Nidhogr protecting the world tree, the base of the world tree, uh, and just chowing down on the, the corpses that are there. 
Uh, and then we have Jormungandr who protects or encircles rather the, the world. And that's really about all he does for the vast majority of his existence until Ragnarok. Got it. All right. So it seems like in this sense, in God of War, they've kind of shoehorned, shoehorned, excuse me, the the dragons from North mythology and kind of molded them into the traditional view of dragons. Uh, same thing with, I guess, yeah, how to train which, your dragon. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that makes sense. I mean, again, uh, you can't really separate, uh, especially as time goes on, you can't separate cultural ideas out, you know, into distinct. Um, purely Norse or purely continental or purely French, purely German even, or things like that. Everything kind of, there's a, there's a melting, uh, a sort of melting pot of cultural ideas as, you know, different areas become more integrated. Right. Yeah, and of those, how many get written down and then what, you know, what are they taking their sources from? So it's all kind of <laughs> hard to pull apart. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, the last ones I did want to touch on here uh, are going to go veer a little bit back into the human-ish side of things. There's the, the Huldra brothers, I guess, which are both supposed to be dwarves. So coming off the back of the dragons, I think dwarves are an apt place to go next. So are these two kind of like one-off, uh, you know, dwarven men, or is there like a race of dwarves in Norse mythology? Yeah, well... Okay, so, so what we call a dwarf is possibly ref what is uh referred to in the uh in the edda as dorkalvar or or Shvartalvar, dark elves or black elves or something like that um you know it's it's what is a dwarf we're not quite sure um we we translate um Shvartalvar into dwarves um because they they tend to be they tend to be mentioned in the same places in the sagas. So, yes, there is a race of dwarves in Norse mythology, and we are pretty sure that when it's uh, it's referred to as either Dvergar or Svartalvar, they're talking about the same thing. Um, and dwarves in general, I mean, there's uh, in, in the, uh, the Poetic Edda, there is uh, the Dvergatal, um, which has the list of dwarves, and it's actually where you get a lot of the names of the dwarves in the Lord of the Rings from. Tolkien, you know, he just lifted a lot of those names, like Dain and Thorin and um, Balin and Gloin and, and Gimli is from Old Norse. He's not from Tvergatal, but he's from Norse uh, literature. Things like that, just lifting the names right out. So yes, dwarves exist in Norse mythology. They are typically referred to as dwarves, sometimes as dark elves, and Brook and Sindri are for sure, well, for sure Brook is a dwarf. Sindri is a little bit weirder. Um, he is a dwarf in Thorstein's saga, Viking uh, he, So he is, he is there in, in that. Um, he is, appears in Skald Skapermal in the Codex Wormianus uh, edition of Skald Skapermal. Um, he is conflated with Etri, who is Broker's brother, uh, and the two of them are craftsmen who forge all sorts of fantastic items for the Aesir. Uh, they, they make uh, Sif's golden hair, uh, Skidbladner, the, the ship of Freyr. It's a ship that is uh, that can be collapsed into the size of uh, your hand and you can fit it into your pocket and then take it out when you need it. Uh, Gungnir, Odin's spear, that returns when it's thrown. Um, and those are made by, those are forged by Brok. Uh, and then Sindri, or Etri, uh, is the smith who makes uh, Gullenbersti, the golden bristled boar that Frey rides. Uh, Droipnir, the gold ring that Woden has that every nine knights creates nine additional copies of itself. Uh, and then most famously, Mjolnir, the, the hammer of Thor. Um, so, you know, they, they're a great race of craftsmen. They're, the two brothers are particularly skilled craftsmen. Um, and so, yeah, so, so having them in the game as, you know, people who forge new items for, uh, for Kratos and his son, you know, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> that makes perfect sense for what they do in the popular conception of dwarves and for what they do in the mythology. Cool. Um, 
So now that we've gone over most of these kind of enemies and creatures, etc., is there any that you can think might have uh, kind of that we haven't covered that stuck out? I, I saw you mentioned kind of real briefly Dark Elves. Is there anything else like that that may have missed the cut here? Well, you see, that's the thing. There's a lot of a lot of weirdness. Yeah, the walruses, which, which we've mentioned before. <laughs> There's, yeah, and that's that's one of the things. There's, um, you know, people people will will transform um, into all sorts of things. Uh, Hjalmar Saga is the the saga where the this evil king uh, transforms into a uh, into a terrifying walrus. Um, and you know he's defeated by someone who transforms into a swordfish, and also by his own daughter who transformed into a por porpoise. You know that this shape shifting is is something that a lot that happens a lot in Norse uh, literature, and doesn't get I think as much attention as it should because there's a lot of weird stuff that happens. Um, but uh, yeah, you know. There's there's the elves, the the Ljosalvar, the Shvartalvar, Dokalvar, however you want to to call them. Uh, so you know the Ljosalvar are the light elves. So th those are who we conceive of as elves in popular culture now. Very similar to what Tolkien kind of gave us with the Lord of the Rings, um, and the dark elves are most likely dwarves. Um, I mean we have the the sort of Dungeons and Dragons idea of of dark elves, as well, but uh, those are kind of removed from the Norse concept. Um, there's animated, uh, for lack of a better term, scare, uh, scarecrows uh, that occur in one saga. Uh, there's uh, all sorts of weird stuff. Wizards and and magicians in Norse literature do weird things. They will they will summon spirits. They will animate things to cause unpleasantness for our heroes. They'll transform into weird things. There's all sorts of stuff that you can mine if you know what you're looking for. Um, you know, and it's just it's just knowing that it's there. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, you, you've got your your classics, your elves, your dwarves, your your undead uh, in myriad of forms, your your shapeshifters, your wizards. Uh, and then you know your berserkers, your 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 men who are part troll and go into to uncontrollable rages, or or people who are just really really good at fighting. So there's a lot of stuff to mind there, and I think they're doing a pretty good job with uh, with hitting the high points in this game. Cool. And yeah, to touch on kind of the creativity of these. Uh the Norse here and their mythology. A lot of it, I would assume, is owed to the fact that they're uh, they're holed inside for a, a good portion of the year telling stories, so that probably helps out uh, quite a bit. <laughs> that doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, thanks for joining us once again, James. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed, and yeah, we definitely have a lot more to talk about in the future. So again, uh, people, if you want to post in the comments below, we'll be reading those, and we'll, uh, we'll take your cue for what kinds of topics you'd like to see in the future. Uh, so yeah, that's been it. Hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for more, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.